Good afternoon, and um, my name is James Stevens here at Reed Pedersen uh, here in Brussels. And I, on behalf of all of our panelists and your Mateo, I'd like to welcome you to our second MEP meets metal conversation here virtually. I do hope that wherever you are in Europe, you are safe and well. Um, I'm going to introduce our panel in a second, um, but uh, first of all, just a few words about our topic for the, today. Um, so we're talking today about global supply chains and trade policy. And our question is, how can we build supply resilience for strategic European interests, industries, and ensure fair competition, question um, mark. You will note to the right of your panel, um, as you're watching, that there is a chat function. So please do use the chat for commentary and questions. Um, and it will be seen by myself and indeed our speakers and some offline moderators. And we will try to in include your comments and your conversation pieces and your questions in our conversation. Um, so just in terms of the topic, yesterday apparently was Europe's moment. But I think I'll say that since the new commission has come into office, it's probably all been metals moment. As I look to the European Green Deal and look at the, some of the objectives within it, it's clear that the metals industry and metals as raw materials have a key role to play in enabling the transformation of our economy, our industrial base and our environment all of the way to that 2050 goal and beyond. Um, so it was interesting yesterday in the Commission's announcements um, that there was a focus indeed on raw materials. And I think if one thing that COVID-19 and the crisis that we are currently living through has shown us, it's the importance of something which is, I think, now becoming termed strategic autonomy. And I'm sure we're going to have a conversation about what that actually means. It was mentioned again in yesterday's um, in yesterday's documents that came out of the Commission in the recovery plan. Um, and for uh, your use, we will be sharing online also the uh, the press release and statement about that plan that Euro Meto made. Um, clearly, what the Commission recognised yesterday is that access to critical raw materials like metals is very important for Europe, um, and um, and and to do so in a way in a world where because of Green Deal and because of the transformation of the economy, we're going to need lots and lots of more metals. Um, so today's discussion, we'll talk a little bit about that. How do we ensure we have the raw materials we need both from our internal circular economy, but also in terms of increasing indigenous supply, and then also securing uh, those materials from elsewhere. To help me talk about that, and they know more about this than I do, um, I'm joined by Nick Karamidis, who is the European Regulatory Affairs Director of Mitalinios. Um, many of you will know uh, the company as uh, one of uh, Greece's leading industrial uh, concerns and, of course, uh, operator of Aluminium of Greece, which I'm told is one of the largest vertically integrated aluminium and alumina companies in Europe. I'm also joined by David Brockas, who's the head of Cobalt Marketing and Trading at Glencore, uh, global mining and metals company, of course. Um, and also, David, it's been announced only recent weeks, is going to take over the chairmanship of um, Cobalt, the Cobalt Institute. Um, David has been uh, very instrumental in the work of the Cobalt industry in terms of developing its own uh, uh, CRAF, its own uh, due diligence and uh, responsible sourcing framework. And we're going to talk about that, I am sure. But Cobalt, clearly a, uh, an important metal in terms of things like the electrification of transport and batteries. Um, I'm also joined on this occasion by two uh, MEPs. Uh, first of all, Mary Fekerainen uh, from the Renew Group within the European Parliament, of course, a Finnish member and a member of the ETRA Committee. Committee. Mary, it's a pleasure to have you back with us. We had your pleasure, the pleasure of your company down in Strasbourg in our Metals Week trip on a panel then. Uh, we're happy to have you here as well. Uh, Mary, of course, is a former Minister of Economic Affairs up in Finland. Uh, and bef before that, both industry and trade. And I think I also saw interior ministry as well. And as I was researching, Mary, I found apparently you have a nickname, Mary. I'm not sure. Do you know this? Apparently, Wikipedia says you are Parliament's Terrier, is what it says on the English version of the Wikipedia page. Clearly, all things in Wikipedia must be true, at least for the person who wrote them. So welcome to Parliament's Terrier, Mary, and uh, happy to have you on the discussion again. And then we're also joined by uh, Rainer Butikofer, which who many of you will know is a German Green member of the European Parliament for the last two terms. 
in the uh, industry committee. Uh, Reinhardt, your Wikipedia page did not mention a nickname for you. So if you want us to christen you one, we're happy to add it later. Currently a member of the AFEC committee, um, but perhaps more importantly for this discussion, also uh, chair of the uh, delegation to China and a substitute on the uh, International Trade Committee. Uh, welcome to both our MEP guests. Um, so uh, we're going to go to the speakers and they're each going to have five minutes to just give their, their views on this topic. Um, but before we do that, I'll also warn you that there is something called a poll. So there's more interactivity, folks, on the line. Uh, if you look at the poll, um, you'll be able to uh, give us your view on whether the priority should be around circular economy, should be around sustainable uh, ind indigenous uh, resources, or indeed diversifying supply. And we'll come back to the poll uh, answers from you in the audience um, at the end of the introductory comments. So. Uh, without further ado, Nick, you're going to kick us off from uh, the perspective of a, a Greek-based European uh, integrated aluminium company. Nick, your five minutes. Over to you, sir. Sure. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, let me start by giving out a few comments on what the global supply chains have suffered uh, through this COVID-19 crisis. So the commodity sector was uh, uh, took a massive blow. According to uh, reports uh, published a couple of weeks ago, the price drop in uh, the first quarter of 2020 reached a staggering 27%. When it comes to aluminium prices, which are of major concern to us, they've collapsed to the lowest levels we've seen since World War II. So uh, this has led half of the world's primary aluminium production operating underwater. What's more relevant for today's debate is that the crisis has revealed how Europe is over-dependent on imports, especially from China. But this shouldn't come as a surprise, though, because Europe's industrial base has been eroding for years now. We've had 12 primary aluminum smelters shutting down since 2005 and many others curtailing operations. On the other hand, we've seen European and global demand more than doubling over the same period of time. And the production gap has been filled almost exclusively by China. So remember this number. China represented 10 percent of global aluminum production back in 2000 and it's roughly 60% today. And European imports of products, aluminum products from China have doubled over the past five years. This is a very disturbing trend. And unless we do something right now, it should be expected to continue in the future. What we see is, for instance, the US adopting the CARES Act. That's a stimulus package, roughly $2 trillion. Well, Trump said it's six trillion, but uh, I trust the figures. So in China announcing its own so-called reboot package, worth above 10%, uh, if I'm not mistaken, of its GDP. And this is on top of subsidies, massive subsidies given to the Chinese companies already. According to an OCD report, which we debated a couple of uh, months ago in the parliament, uh, out of all documented subsidies in the global aluminum sector, we've had 85% going to just five Chinese firms. So yesterday, as you rightly pointed out, Europe announced its own recovery plan, 750 billion euros grants and, and loans, Europe is betting on what they call an open strategic autonomy. That's the, the new term, the new tagline. And uh, actually, I'm quoting here, Europe hopes to shape the new system of global economic governance and develop mutually beneficial bilateral relations. I'm not sure how this will translate in real life terms. The truth is we have an incredible over-reliance on imports from one single source, right? And we've seen how this affects everyday life for European companies and citizens. And this is not sustainable. And I'm using the term sustainable very, very carefully here. If we are to have any chance of reaching our uh, climate goals, then we need to safeguard ourselves against future shocks to global supply chains, such as the one we suffered uh, recently or continue suffering. The Green Deal and our goal for climate neutrality by 2050, as you rightly mentioned in the beginning, would mean that we need much more non-ferrous metals. We've had a couple of reports recently, the Institute for European Studies, we've had the World Bank, JRC, highlighting that we need non-ferrous metals for renewables equipments, lightweight vehicles, energy efficient buildings, batteries, you name it. All those so-called transition enablers. So the World Bank estimates that we would need roughly 200% more metals for wind turbines, 300% for solar, and 1,000% more for batteries. Right. This is where the strategic autonomy discussion kicks in. 
we need to maximize our own industrial production and raw materials mining here in Europe. And even though some may think this would clash with our climate targets, the truth is exactly the opposite. Industrial production in Europe is already amongst the cleanest, in some cases the cleanest in the world, and we're constantly improving. The example comes again from the primary aluminum sector. We're three times less carbon intensive than producing the same metal in China, right? So every ton of aluminum produced in Europe saves around 13 tons of CO2 if it replaces Chinese aluminum. I had a question uh, asked to me a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, actually. Uh, I was at a panel with the European Climate House and they asked me, yes, Mr. Karamidas, but do we really want heavy industry or energy intensive industry in Europe? That's not the question. That's misleading. The question is whether demand for the products exists and whether we're just adopting and not in my backyard approach. So I'm saying that boosting competitiveness of the European production, so increasing the EU share in meeting global demands for products, would actually or should actually displace carbon intensive production from other regions of the world, at least as regards imports to the EU. That's the first step. So we would forge our strategic autonomy genuinely and contribute tangibly to reducing global emissions. And let me close by saying that this is indeed the most effective and probably the most diplomatic way of pushing our global trading partners into raising their own levels of climate ambition. Because we keep talking about Europe leading by example in this fight against climate change, but our ability to actually succeed in that largely depends on us reestablishing ourselves as a very significant producer of clean goods and raw materials rather than just importing or consuming. So this would send the strongest possible signal to global trading partners if we boost our sustainable production in Europe that decarbonization makes sense from a climate perspective, but also economically. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. And, and thanks also for, for sticking to your five minutes pretty much precisely by uh, the clock that I was looking at. Some really strong points there uh, about, um, certainly I think at the end there, about the climate leadership ambitions that we have and, and maybe showing that industries can grow through climate leaderships like like the industry that we're talking about with today is kind of an interesting point. I'm going to go over to David. David, you and Glencore, you, you have a global view necessarily because you're a global uh, company operating in many of the markets that we're, we're talking about and, and sourcing your materials from around the world into Europe. Um, David, over, over to you for your five minutes. Yeah, thank you very much. So thanks for the invitation. So you're right. I mean, Glencore is, a, is a, one of the largest global mining company. Just to give you a sense of the scale, uh, we operate around 150 mining and metallurgical sites around the world in more than 50 countries, and we employ uh, approximately 160,000 people. Within Glencore, as you've said, James, I'm heading our cobalt marketing and trading activities. So today, I will naturally focus on this metal which, as you know, is a crucial component in lithium-ion batteries that go into electric vehicles and consumer electronics. And for those uh, that are not uh, very technical, um, cobalt is actually required in batteries because it serves the rather important function of preventing the battery to catch on fire. Um, Glencore, with more than 7,000 tons of cobalt metal produced in Norway and Australia, and 30,000 tons of cobalt produced in the DRC, is the largest producer of responsible cobalt in the world. Um, the size of the market, it's a small market. This year we estimate it's going to be around 120,000 tons. Whereas in, 25, uh, in 2025, uh, we believe that total demand for cobalt might exceed 225,000 tons. So an increase of almost 100,000 tons. Very, it's very significant. To fulfill this huge and exponential increase in demand, the market and the EU will have to heavily rely on DRC supply because the hazards of the geology located most of the cobalt reserves in this country, in the copper belt, which is you know in the south of the Congo, um, uh, near Zambia. So the purpose of my intervention today is to convey to the audience two key messages. The first one is that it is possible to produce cobalt in a responsible manner, even in the DRC. And the second one, it is uh, my second point is that it's very likely that past 2025, cobalt, cobalt demand will exceed cobalt supply. And without any additional investment in mining, there could be a shortage of cobalt. So first point is, um, 
It is possible to produce cobalt in a responsible manner, even in the DRC. Indeed, what we are seeing is that every cobalt producer in the DRC will need to comply with the requirements defined by the RMI, that stands for the Responsible Minerals Initiative, in accordance with the latest edition of the OECD due diligence guideline for responsible su supply chain and minerals from high risk areas. Even without a regulatory framework in place, sourcing poli policies are changing and end consumers are asking for third, part third party certification and annual external audits. For us, it became an absolute requirement and a priority for more customers in Europe, but also in Asia. Even in the ASM sector, so ASM stands for artisanal and small scale mining, standards are being developed and the cobalt in industry is showing a sense of collective responsibility by trying to help improve the working conditions in the ISM sector, fight child labor, invest in indication, and develop alternative livelihood options for the ISM communities. Large European companies like Umicore, BSF, or BMW are actually already working towards that goal with our direct support. While we fully support the development of industry standards, we, have, we also have to be careful about the proliferation of too many standards. We think that um, we, need, we need to carefully harmonize the requirements to avoid the multiplication of audits. Too many audits could become a burden for miners and constitute a trade hurdle and slow down supply increases. While we also fully support the introduction of responsible sourcing requirements, the EU needs to be aware that the intense focus on responsible sourcing created a perception in the market that cobalt cannot be produced responsibly in the DRC. Because of that, it became a trend to de-risk its supply chain away from the DRC, but also to try to eliminate cobalt out of the battery chemistry by investing millions of euros into research and development. It creates uncertainty for the miners, might slow down investment in mining, and if implemented, this would certainly have a negative impact on the poor ISM communities. We believe that if the EU is looking at introducing responsible sourcing requirements for cobalt, it has a role in preventing that companies turn away from poor, poor performers, and instead they should encourage, the EU should support and encourage uh, collaborations that drive improvement. Um, my second point was uh, about supply and demand and the fact that past 2025, it is very likely that uh, the market will be in deficit. First of all, I'd like to say that recycling is not the answer. Until 2030, it will remain marginal because um, that's only in, starting in 2030 that you will see a large inflow of used batteries um, for, for, for the recycling uh, industry. Instead, we think that the EU should be promoting batteries with a very long life to reduce its dependency on mining and recycling. In addition to that, we think that in order to attract cobalt to Europe, the EU should also carefully design its chemical regulation. As it stands, the draft regulation on cobalt salts classification, for example, uh, with a very low occupational exposure limit, would just would simply kill the current European refining industry and prevent any increase in cobalt refining capacity in Europe. And finally, it's my last point, and I think it's a crucial one, I think the EU should help European companies to secure cobalt on a long-term basis. Because when I look at our cobalt sales portfolio, even though we welcome regional diversification, it is sad to, to notice that we're only working with a few Euro European companies on a long-term basis. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, and also, thank you for largely taking, uh, staying to time. I mean, two things I took off from there uh, on the external side. First, Nick had mentioned the role that Europe can have in a kind of climate leadership way, leading the way, not only in, in, in saying we're going to tackle climate, but also that showing that industries can thrive in that process in our continent. I think what was interesting on your kind of global perspective, David, was very much the um, the idea also that what we talk about here, and, and you mentioned very strongly the responsible sourcing, which is clearly a, a key issue for for your part of the metal sector in particular, but for others as well, um, 
that, that also we have a responsibility in Europe also to, yes, to export standards to make sure that the, that, that, that the effect that we're seeking actually happens and there might not be the right kind of effects uh, from what you were talking about. We'll explore that later. I also thought interesting around the recycling and the, and the circular economy story, which clearly if I read yesterday's documentation from the Commission, it's at the heart of how they're thinking about strategic autonomy. But even there, perhaps the evolution of how that happens, particularly in the cobalt and the batteries area, might take a bit of time. And there might be other things in EU policy that we don't think about that link with chemicals, I thought interesting. We don't necessarily think about the interplay between chemical regulation and strategic autonomy. Although I note in the recent roadmap from the Commission on Sustainable Chemicals that the word strategic autonomy have been scrawled all over it by someone at a political level in the Commission. On that point, I will hand over to our two MEP speakers, Mary and Reinhardt. Mary, I'll start with you. Could I have five minutes maximum from you on what you're thinking in, in re reflection compared to our two gentlemen uh, from the industry? Mary. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, from the Finnish uh, experience, I can say that... Uh, Without a successful and competitive European economy, the Green Deal road will be a difficult one. Our industry and carbon future face many challenges today. We all know this. Protectionism is uh, on the race. A large amount of state aid is challenging the principles of market economy. Industrial and intellectual property rights are not being respected uh, as they should be and so on. Finland lives from the export of its forest and metal sector products. We cannot, uh, with the ingredients of the moderate success, have been a highly skilled workforce, functioning and fair markets, an open economy and hard work, of course. In the EU, especially now, we will need competitiveness instead of protectionism and a true market economy where the state has a role in guaranteeing a level of social fare, it is my opinion. Improving competitiveness will require a radically faster and more efficient exploitation of our knowledge potential and transforming it into innovations and commercial products and services. The often heard mantra of the Lisbon strategy that the EU is the most competitive economic area in the world of 2020 uh, seems distant now. This transform, transform, transformation of knowledge into products happens quicker in many countries outside the EU than it does inside EU, Europe. This includes the European metal industry was output maybe is about 10% of the global total. The main responsibility lies, of course, with the member states. Ten years ago, we set the goal uh, of uh, spending 3% of our GDP in research and innovation, but today only four member states have reached the goal. What about EU's own actions? Horizon research and innovation funding should have uh, an increased focus on applied research. More attention should be paid on collaboration research and innovation with the industry. Yesterday, the Commission published the recovery package proposal, which includes more funding for the, uh, the, the horizon. I hope uh, it also increased the funding for applied research and innovation. By the way, I, I, I don't see that it's so, so very good case that uh, uh, 500 uh, million euros uh, will be given in 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 grants uh, grants 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 that's that's not a good issue but it, it, it is another story it's another story common providers of finance such as i i eip uh the government does well but could do more to finance high risk innovation my first message is the road to a carbon neutral EU will require that the bottlenecks of industrial innovations, innovation in the EU are opened and competitiveness of the, the industry is improved. My second message is about digitalization. New digital technologies like the 5G at first will need to be widely applied 
in the metal industry processes. Digitalization offers a challenge for the productivity leap, which is, for instance, uh, South Korea has already taken. Disruptive 6G six, six technology, te technology is already on its way as we approach the next decade. It implies an extremely fast data transfer capacity and productivity gains that can be gained from data use. However, without the general improvement of innovat innovat innovativeness in the EU, we are taking the risk that the first users will be somewhere, once again, somewhere outside Europe. My third and last message warns about having the right framework conditions for industry on our way to a carbon neutral, neutral Europe. EU's goal of the climate neutral Europe consists of three parallel goals of climate indicators. The first one is the reduction of emissions. We all know this very well. And the second is the increase of renewable energy. And the third indicator is the improvement of energy efficiency. An equal balancing of those three cannot be right. Cannot be right. Why? I explain. I would like to raise an example of Swedish Finnish SSAP, LKAP, and Wattenfall Innovation Project which will enable the transition from carbon-based to a hydrogen-based production technology. For example, in the Ruki factories in Finland, the transition implies an increase in energy consumption from 1.3 terawatt hours to 8 terawatt hours per year. In Finland, the energy total consumption is 300 ter ter terawatt hours. It's a very big amount, very shortly then. At the same time, Finland's emissions will be re re reduced by about 7%. A steel industry requires a transformation not only in steel production, but also in circular economy solutions for materials and the use of hydrogen technology. Means. Energy efficiency will be reduced. It would be, however, unreasonable if the European industry should invest heavily in improving energy efficiency if at the same time innovative technology can improve metal industries' competitiveness. This is my three message. Thank you. Thank you, Maui. And, uh, and thank you also for bringing the role of kind of, uh, of innovation and knowledge into our discussion. Um, I, I, I kind of link it to something David said about um, the kind of signals within inside Europe, whether that's on circular economy or on the link to chemicals and, and what kind of signals we have to keep value chains as a whole in here. Because um, I'm guessing the more uh, we get down to the kind of um, the basic industries, keeping as many of those basic industries locally is probably going to keep the value chain here and probably going to lead to more innovation and value creation here in Europe. So very much relevant for today's debate. Um, I, I encourage you all, I'm going to, why not, just before I come to you, I'm going to say, because I know why not's going to close us out in terms of the speakers and, and has the, the great opportunity to reflect on what other people have said and pick up on points they've said. But just to throw into the mix our poll on question one. So we asked the question of of the 70 odd people here in the on the call. Um, yesterday's recovery plan talked about improving Europe's strategic autonomy. Um, what should be the top priority? 48% advance, advancing the EU circular economy, 31% investing in sustainable EU mining and primary production, so indigenous resources, 20% securing diversified supply of raw materials from abroad. Uh, so an interesting picture there from the metals industry as a whole that is on the, on the line. I know here we have two of our commodities represented, uh, aluminium and cobalt, so slightly different views depending on the commodity i'm guessing but an interesting picture from those on the line reinhardt you have five minutes to round us out in terms of those introductory comments um over to you sir well thanks first of all for having me i will choose a more narrow approach than my colleague and will focus my remarks uh mostly on the dimension of um one particular section of 
of the conversation, which is about rare earth. Uh, I find that this, um, at the moment, gets interestingly low levels of attention, even though we all recall that seven to nine years ago, this was a huge issue, uh, very controversial, uh, very threatening. Uh, at the time, China, China uh, blocked exporting rare earth um, over a tussle they had uh, with Japan uh, regarding the Senkaku Islands. And if you look at how, in the case of Hong Kong, China signals to the world that international treaty obligations don't really concern them if they have decided to ditch those obligations, as here is the case with regard to the Sino-British Joint Declaration, then I think we cannot operate, we should not operate under the assumption that China will most reliable, in a most reliable way, always honor its industrial obligations. So I think we should look a bit back and, 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 and learn a lesson or two from the discussions that we had uh, several years ago that were organized, for instance, in the European Rare Earth Competency Network that published a widely respected report in 2014. There certainly is a dimension uh, for technological solutions focusing on efficiency, focusing on recycling, or focusing also on the option of engineering out the need to employ uh, some rare earth, as has been done partially in sometimes some types of permanent magnets. But certainly that will not be sufficient. And that's why we need, in addition to uh, an innovation policy in that regard, we also need a strategic trade and industrial investment policy. And it might be instructive to look at what happens in the United States. Uh, President Trump, under the uh, Defense Production Act of 1950, has um, published some presidential determinations that direct the U.S. government also to um, further uh, the cause of investing in um, mining and processing capacity in the United States. The, the biggest mine, the biggest rare earth mine in the United States still is Mountain Pass Mine um, that used to be Mali Corps. Now it's a different owner. And they came into operation again in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. But to this day, whatever they mine, they have to send to China for processing. So even if they have their own mining capacity, which is, by the way, much greener than anything you will find in China by, by environmental criteria. Uh, they're still dependent on China. And China has strengthened its hold on the first three or four stages of processing. And they're moving downstream in the industry. So I think it would be of strategic interest if we talk about autonomy, or at least maybe autonomy is too big a word, but I would say at least reducing dependency. If we want to go for that aim, I think there should be a coordinated policy of teaming up with trading partners to access other sources and of investing into uh, industrial uh, processing um, capacities. And there are other sources. We, we're, not, uh, we're not forced to rely on China as a source. Um, we have um, rare earth in Greece. We have rare earth in Sweden, in uh, Greenland. We have partners in Canada, Namibia, Malaysia, the United States. But when the prices started exploding um, eight years ago, 
we stopped thinking about strategic alternatives. And I think that was a mistake then, and it is a mistake today. And uh, of course, that cannot be leveraged just by private investment. Here, the, the government has either on a national level or on the European level has to play a role as a partner too. Um, and I would certainly welcome if we would not try to go it alone. Some of the rhetoric that I hear when, when people talk about uh, strategic autonomy sounds a little bit too too um, narrow maybe so so I, I, I like um, uh, Commissioner Hogan's new phrase of open strategic autonomy already a little better um, but I think if we're realistic we cannot sort of deal with this challenge just on our own and we don't need to, and we would have partners, but it needs a strategic policy, and I think we should get back to that. Thank you, um, Reinhard. So, uh, thank you. A, a clear message from you on that, and a clear focus in your comments. Um, and I like the fact that you ended on that open strategic autonomy piece, which which Nick had also picked upon. So let me just unpick. Let's just unpick some of those subject matters for the next. Um, 25 minutes uh, i know mary you're gonna you knew part slightly earlier but we'll 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 try and involve you in the conversation now as well um let's just take the the, the first bit right now where you start where you were starting which is the kind of the, the thing that kind of doesn't worry me but kind of is a question mark around this whole open strategic autonomy of and though what does that mean is is that kind of tension we have as a, a as a kind of rules-based system that believes in rules and applying them and, and Ryan, you very much started off with, well, you know, look at what happened in the past with China. You know, can we, basically your question was, can we trust the Chinese, right? We operate in this global world. A lot of the things that we're talking about are elsewhere in the world. I'm interested in that kind of global playing field in which we play in our, and can we rely upon the rules? Do we need new rules? Do we need to be a little bit more real politic about this, Nick? You know, do we need to look at our own house and, and get some instruments and some policies in that give us a bit more clout in the world? We've got a white paper on uh, foreign subsidies coming up in, in quarter two, according to yesterday's work program. And we've got our, our trade policy in quarter four, according to the work from yesterday, uh, work program yesterday. Nick, I've got, I'll turn to you first. You know, it, can we rely on a rules-based system globally to well, solve these problems for us? And, uh, and what do we need in that open strategic autonomy piece? Well, I think what happened with the appointment of judges, or rather the non-appointment of judges in the WTO appellate body, uh, proves that uh, we cannot rely exclusively on uh, the international organizations to uh, ensure a global playing, level playing field. So uh, I think that it's necessary, absolutely necessary, to uh, look a bit uh, within our own uh, territory and uh, review our competition policy. Uh, state aid policy and antitrust policy, mergers and acquisitions and so on, thus focusing on the global level rather than just looking at the internal market. And uh, actually, we need to identify what I call strategic autonomy. Well, uh, there are different views on what that means exactly, but and global competitiveness of our industry mm -hmm. as objectives as common interest. And we need to focus on uh, how we prioritize, so to speak, uh, the use of uh, EU produced raw materials and products in Europe, and maximize their added value within Europe, and uh, at the same time, perhaps even limit our exports of scrap and waste, thus boosting the recycling rates in Europe, within Europe. And then when it comes to trade defense measures, well, um, what we see is overprotectionism by the US and China, of course, well, China is a different story, but when it comes to the US, the American America first uh, principle is still there. And it is um, the um, backbone of the CARES Act that was launched uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I think that uh, we cannot um, push forward for the death of multilateralism, but nonetheless, what we need to do is be a bit more pragmatic. I would ask um, this question to our fellow MEPs, if I'm allowed. I mean, you uh, are allowed, Nick. You can ask questions to them. Beautiful. Uh, Mau, I think Maui wants to come in, so maybe direct your question to Maui. Well, uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> sure. Yeah, go ahead. Please. 
So ask the question first. Ask the question, okay, Nick. Okay. Ask the question. Well, I thought he wanted to comment some, on something uh, first. I, I remember, because uh, I've, I've been following uh, both of you uh, uh, on the uh, European Parliament, the speeches and so on and so forth. Uh, I noticed in January, back in January, you were one of those people that spoke about mining in Europe. You were one of those people that actually uh, articulated, uh, were vocal about carbon leakage. Would you say that uh, Europe got it right? in their industrial strategy and the recovery plan that was launched yesterday, because honestly speaking, diversification, and I heard Mr. Butikoff speak about that, diversification of imports is part of uh, the open strategic autonomy, but maybe we should also uh, make sure that we maximize our own production as well. I want to know on that. Have we got it right on, on indigenous resources and promoting I, that I, in industrial sure. policy? <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, I, I only very, very shortly want, want to say that, of course, we need uh, fair trade policy in the world, and uh, WTO is very important. And we, for us, for, for European Union and member countries in in the, in the EU, of course, and so on. But I, my experience, if you can understand that Finland is quite a, a very small country, and uh, we hope that in cooperation in in uh, in uh, in other EU countries, we we could uh, we could uh, uh, manage many trades. Up, up, um, uh, excuse me. Um, problem. Let me say problems. I don't remember correct words. Obstacles. Obstacles. Are correct words. But my main message is competitiveness. We have to improve our competitiveness in industry. Without doing that, it doesn't help us to succeed much more better in international trade policy. If our uh, products, if our industry, uh, if uh, competitiveness of our industry is not good enough. And now, although I mentioned earlier that I don't like this kind of risk recovery pack package, it's not, it's not so good. It's not so good. Grants, it's not a good idea. But in okay. Any case, in any case, there are well, no I have to contradict you now. Okay, okay. But guys, before we before we get into a, 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 a debate about grants yeah, versus loans, ahead. let me let me bring David in on, and then I'll come back to you right now. Let me bring David in on on the question of kind of global rules, but also I think the question that that that's been. Uh, that, that Nick has to marry, actually, David, about kind of indigenous resources within Europe. You're a mining company, right? With operations in yeah. many of the places that Reinhardt mentioned. I, I guess as Reinhardt was mentioning those countries, I imagine maybe not the cobalt part, but Glencore generally has interest in all sorts of places. Like, how do you see Europe positioned? Is Europe doing enough, do you think, on that kind of indigenous uh, mining production? I, I know you come from cobalt, but I'm thinking more generally with a metal and a non-ferrous metal sector on the call. You know, are we doing are we doing good along the piece, or would you like to see Europe do more in terms of indigenous uh, supply of metals? Uh, I mean, sp specifically on cobalt, it is difficult to comment because you cannot fight geology. You know, <laughs> like so true. true. You know, in Finland, you have a project in Finland, all right? The, 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 and but this project is a nickel cobalt project. Cobalt always comes, uh, you have to know that it comes as a byproduct of copper or nickel, right? So you need to invest into copper mines or nickel mines. Mm. This is what uh, nickel prices and copper prices are going to drive the economics of a project that will eventually produce cobalt. Cobalt is only treated as, as a byproduct and will bring some credit to your production cost. So, yeah, it's, uh, eventually, you know, like, there is nothing that can be done, right? Like this project in Finland might produce a maximum of 2,000 tons of cobalt. Yeah. Uh, this is nothing, right? Compared to, you remember the figures I gave you? Mm -hmm. By 2025, we'll need another 100,000 tons of cobalt. And that's a very pessimistic scenario, right? With this boost, this new, uh, uh, following, following the, the COVID, right? It might even go faster. So, uh, so David, David, given that the uh, the thing that Reinhardt was talking about in, in terms of the rules and trust and working with other people around the world, yeah, in, in, specifically for Cobalt, that sounds like it's a, it's a better play for us in making sure that that rules are followed and that we work with others to secure and diversify supply. 
Is that is that how you see it? Do you, do you pick up on what, what Reinhardt's saying and say, well, actually, we need the EU to do more in making sure we set some global rules so we can we can all have this open strategic autonomy? Well, you know, I'm 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 a, I'm a you know private for I work for a private for profit company, and I I, I deal with companies, right? I, I don't deal with regions, right? So I I, I don't. I won't comment on, on, on China in general, right, or, or Europe, but but what I can tell you is that we are establishing and we see Asian companies establishing strategic partnerships directly with us and they are interested in securing material on a five, ten years basis. Um, and and we do that through contractual agreements and um, and we believe that they will fulfill their contractual obligations. We are happy to do exactly the same with European companies, and and we have a few long-term partners, uh, and it, it's working very well. But but the issue is that um, you know if you look at the cobalt at the battery supply chain, for example, it starts from the mining, then you need to recycle, produce precursor, cathode, and batteries. Well, Europe is behind Asia in every one of the of this segment. And I've, I've talked about the chemical regulation, the chemical regulation that's being introduced in Europe on, on cobalt salts, for example, is going to it's going to make the gap even worse. I mean, talking about China, China has not cornered cobalt production capacity, right? They have investment in the DRC, but it does not account for more than 15, 17 percent of the overall global production. Mm -hmm. What they have cornered instead is refining capacity. And that, and that, David, is a thing that you were saying earlier is affected by the chemical. Break. Let me throw it over to Reinhardt. Yeah. And, and Reinhard, Finland, Reinhard. Uh, James, excuse me, but Finland has a large company, a refiner, cobalt refiner in Finland, right? It used mm. to be owned by Freeport. Now it's owned by Yumiko. Yeah. Um, they could be at risk, right, just by imposing this, this regulation. So, so Ryan, I'll not ask you to go into chemicals policy, but clearly there are some things, there are some things domestically within our own legislation that, that might be, we can't change geology, as David said, but might be able to change the rest of the value chain for something like cobalt. Yeah. So chemicals seems to be one of those. But Rana, I just want to go back to what you were talking about in terms of that global marketplace, the how do we get rules and how do we work with others? I mentioned two things coming up, some of which I'm guessing uh, Inter will look at as a committee, the, the, the white paper on foreign subsidies uh, and then the, the broader trade policy. Have you already got in your mind the kind of approach that you'd want to see in either of those two papers? Are there, are there key things for you, Reinhardt, that you think could, could answer some of the questions you yourself raised in your comments? Yes. Oh, so sorry, bye-bye. Bye, Mary. Thank you for your commentary. Let me make one remark first. Um, sure. I, I resent somewhat uh, when people say Europe should do more. Who are you talking about? <laughs> Who is this yeah. that should do more? Europe doesn't open mines. Europe, Europe doesn't run mines. That's private companies that do that. Yeah. And um, I think it was a strategic mistake by some of the actors in uh, the business sector not to take the long-term view when we could have had a chance of building more own capacities uh, a, a couple of years ago. Um, and the second um, uh, kind of signal that I, that I sensed from some of the conversations uh, going on was that, that maybe we should not be as ambitious with our own uh, environmental standards in, in order to be more competitive. Now, let me tell let me tell you just this one example, again from the raw uh, from the rare earth sector. When Malicorp tried to study what the conditions were that would allow them to reopen their mountain pass mine to be competitive with the Chinese, they found that by adhering to stringent Californian environmental standards and implementing those standards to the fullest, they could be competitive with the Chinese. So there's not a trade-off between standards and competitiveness. I would rather argue that long-term competitiveness of European industry, including mining, will only be possible on the basis 
a sustainability. Look at Austria, look at Germany. We have some of the greenest mining technologies. This could be a strength of European industry. Let me and go as, regards your question, as regards your question on what we do with subsidies, I trust that the European Commission should follow the advice given by Business Europe in their China strategy paper when they said reverse the burden of proof. Um, I would also advocate that we make use of a, a clause in China's accession protocol to the uh, WTO in 2001, where in paragraph 15b we have a legal title to put in place uh, an extra China-centric uh, anti-subsidy mechanism. Nobody's ever tried doing that, but we could do that and we have to do that. Okay, let me so let me just pick up on the first bit about the environmental standards and competitiveness in two different ways, perhaps. Nico, I, I saw you, I'm not sure you were shaking your head, but I, I felt you wanted to comment on that. There's been a lot in the chat, clearly, um, and, and I think you brought up like climate leadership in Europe should also, uh, you know, should enable European companies to thrive. So I think you talked about the same kind of idea as why not. There's a lot in the chat, clearly, about things like carbon border adjustment mechanisms and, and maybe that's an answer that helps us show leadership but also bring other people with us so if you could comment on that and david maybe i could ask you also i mean you you made a very good play about um about how glencore has been leading and cobalt institute and others have been leading on on pushing responsible sourcing part of that might include environmental standards that we that we set in the future yeah. um, and, and due diligence around that and, and almost passing that around and, and trying to upgrade other people the artisanal and small mind you mentioned. So maybe I could ask you about how you see a company like Glencore pushing out kind of European standards in, in a kind of way. But first, Nick, Nick, could you just come in on that on, on that issue of environmental standards and competitiveness, particularly in the light of CO2, I think? Sure, yes. Uh, well, uh, for us in the non ferrous metals business, I, I would say that uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism could not be the silver bullet that will solve everything. Uh, honestly speaking, mm -hmm. uh, it might be uh, a good uh, tool, a uh, practical tool perhaps to uh, push our global trading partners, but uh, it will not solve everything. And uh, quite frankly, the carbon border adjustment mechanism only functions as regards imports, right? It doesn't uh, function as regards exports and uh, global competitiveness in, in uh, the activities of European companies outside Europe as well. So uh, this is something that uh, uh, you need to make sure that, uh, first of all, you avoid retaliation measures. And we know uh, that uh, if, for instance, Donald Trump gets reelected in the U.S. and we adopt something like that and they don't uh, follow suit in our in their climate, in our climate ambitions, then uh, we should expect probably some uh, some really severe retaliation measures. And uh, this is something that we need to consider if we want our economy to thrive rather than uh, a navel gaze. Basically, we want we want something that functions and protects. Well, the word protects is always bad. Uh, and uh, Mr. Butikov, I mentioned earlier that uh, companies invest and uh, we shouldn't see, uh, we shouldn't ask for, uh, well, we shouldn't ask for a lot for, from the European Union or from the European Commission or whatever. Uh, the truth of the matter is that um, the reason that uh, 12 smelters shut down over the past 15 years in Europe has to do with electricity prices in Europe. So smelters are uh, established, primary aluminum smelters are established where cheap electricity exists, competitive electricity. Like exists. in Germany, and, for instance. Well, we I have, see we have aluminum smelters that have been accused of their European neighbor competitors of having too low energy prices, right? If you compare those prices to uh, what uh, the Chinese are getting or the U.S. and Canada companies are getting, uh, then uh, you will see that, uh, unfortunately, and I see that uh, some of the people from the German uh, aluminium companies are already in our group, actually, <laughs> chatting. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, we would argue that those prices are not globally competitive, unfortunately. So, uh, so I you see, I mean, you uh, see, no, that makes that sorry, that makes absolutely no sense to me. You can't compare 
European prices with Chinese prices, just as you can't compare European free labor with Chinese forced labor. Doesn't make a sense. I agree with you on that. And uh, by that, I would also add that uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism that has been proposed should extend to cover also other aspects uh, of our policies. Some of them were covered by David earlier, such as the human rights and uh, uh, social security. You've alluded to that in the discussion on, on uh, China's cables in the European Parliament as well. And uh, I think we all agree on that. But you mentioned that we can't compare power prices globally. The truth of the matter is that the non-ferrous metal sector is a price taker. So we don't roll over costs, increased costs to our consumers because the price is set at the LME, the London Metal Exchange. So we cannot simply in include added costs or incremental regulatory costs or climate related costs to our uh, 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 production costs and roll them over to our consumers that would deprive us of competitiveness that would throw us out of the market and this is what's been happening and the the replacement the replacement that's been going on is coal-fired electricity uh smelters well um coal-fired electricity powering aluminum smelters in china this is what the the european aluminum industry has been replaced with this is and the unfortunate so, part. Can I, can I bring David in there, Reinhardt? Because yeah, because sure, I but I just wanted to announce one thing. I have to leave in two and a half minutes because the intercommittee yeah. is beginning its session. Perfect. Uh, so we'll close. I'll just give David one more comment and then we'll come back for one last round for 10 seconds each from you. David, I, part of the thing that I think we've just been discussing is we're all in agreement that we want a, a sustainable industry in Europe in all its forms as part of this Green Deal. We see some competition from outside of, of Europe, clearly. Uh, and sometimes, and I think we could all agree, as Ryan was just saying, we'd ideally like the rest of the world to kind of follow our standards, right? To have as high environmental level of protection uh, for their citizens and their environment as we do here in Europe. No one, I, I don't think we do all, any of us would disagree with that. In your sector, the kind of thing that you've been doing, I'm interested, just very briefly, 10, 20 seconds on how you see your company as a global company kind of exporting those high standards around the world. And we, we talk very much about the, the sourcing issue in, 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 in the DRC. Just yeah. a few seconds on that before I go round for a final round. Sure. I mean, um, the way, the, the, I think the way we would, we would try to promote those standards, right, is, is, is what we've done over the past year. Right? We've, we've entered into very long-term agreements. We've made them public and we've identified and we've publicly identified that one of of the what was contingent to these agreements was a third party independent certification that's a way of setting up a trend and and it looks like it's working because more and more of the customers that we're dealing with are satisfied with this type of certification and they are also asking similar requirements from other producers so interesting market almost market driven there customer driven uh, it's customer driven creating... because of the fear of, you know, reputational impact if yeah. they were to be it's associated with child labor in the DRC, right? Okay. I mean, we we tend to forget that eventually the EV revolution will work. Also, if be, if consumers like you and me are interested in buying EVs, and and if cobalt that's contained or other metals uh, do not um, satisfy with very high environmental and social standards. Well, you might decide to stick to your IC car, right? Mm -hmm. then, okay, David. Thanks. That's an interesting point, and one I find fascinating is how does debate here in Europe and, and policy debate how does that cascade down into reputational issues, and how does that mean that Europe, in effect, evolves markets globally? Yeah. Uh, free commercial actors yeah. like yourself, not because, just through legislation. Yeah. I'm going to end us there because I know, Ryan, you're going to jump into the intercommittee. I don't want to lose you, and everyone else is going to start having their dinner or their lunch as you might call it here. I call it dinner because I'm from the north of England. Um, uh, we had a question um, to the to everyone on the on, on the call, which was from today's debate. What is your top priority for the EU's recovery measures to improve strategic autonomy? 26% went for stronger EU trade and competition policy. 20% went with partnership with other world regions. 13% balanced EU environmental norms. 26% uh, support for EU innovation and investment and 
uh, for circular economy measures. I'm just going to ask, go on to round the round the room uh, for the people on the panel. What would be for you the key focus out of those options? And you can only choose your top priority. Uh, Nick, top priority out of those uh, five choices we've given you, what would it be for you? I'd go with the first one, actually. Stronger okay. EU trade and competition policy. Thank you, Nick. David, where are you going? Sorry. Which of those five, you're, you're which of those, <laughs> which of those five questions? We have stronger EU trade and competition policy, yeah. Yeah. partnerships with other world regions, balanced environmental regulations, oh, yeah, I see su in the polls. Yeah. support for EU innovation investment or circular economy measures. Which will be your choice? Well, if I, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm biased, right? If I look at at cobalt in particular, I think establishing long-term partnership is key. So I would go okay. with one. Very good. So let's hope the Commission does a bit more on its implementing its EU Africa strategy in particular. Um, Reinhardt, the final words are to you, sir. Which one would you choose and why? And then we'll let you get off to, to the intercommittee. I'd go for number one, stronger EU trade and competition policy. We have to bring our own house in order first. Very good. Sounds like a good uh, opinion then, keeping our own house in order. And with that, I will say thank you to all three of you. Thank you to the uh, the people from uh, around throughout Europe in the metals industry who've joined us for uh, this hour-long conversation. I hope you've taken some from, from it. I know there was a lot in the chat because I was looking at different points of view. Uh, we'll be sure to circulate that chat to Reinhardt and Mary so in case they didn't have an opportunity to see what people said post uh, this uh, call. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, everyone. And do say, st stay safe wherever you are in Europe. Thank you Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers.